mic are being recorded, so in the video only we will be visible. Standing talking to somebody, and I heard somebody behind me say, uh, yeah, so this guy raised his hand and said, well, won't, won't this therapy you're doing uh, put the uh, kid in danger of being killed by his parents? And uh, so he said, uh, and I re replied, yeah, that's what this therapy is about, is to get uh, them to kill the kid. And I thought, this sounds like an interesting person. And I turned around and uh, saw Dick Schwartz. Uh, and we hit it off almost immediately. Uh, we both are sort of tough Jews, and we both played uh, Division Three uh, varsity sports. I played basketball at Clark, and he played uh, football, of all things. Uh, he was a defensive back at uh, U University of Illinois something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our, our relationship consisted of playing basketball and hanging around and sort of talking about therapy in general ways. And we became, we were sort of part of uh, Rich Simon's inner circle. And he was quite a basketball player himself, Rich. Uh, he was the best of all of us. And uh, so it wasn't until 95 that I realized what Dick was actually doing. I actually, I read some of his stuff. And when we talked, I got a sense he did pretty much what I did, which was in those days, strategic hypnosis, uh, mm -hmm. you know, proceeding from Milton Erickson and Jay Haley and Paul Butslavic and all those people. Yeah. Uh, and so it wasn't until 95, it got to be a joke because we all presented it. We both presented at the big national meetings because that's how we marketed ourselves. But it got to be a joke that we never got scheduled in such a way that we could see each other present. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even we asked Dick, you know, Rich Simon, uh, please schedule us so we can see each other. And he said, absolutely, I'll do it. And he never did it <laughs> for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. And so in 95, uh, Dick was presenting at uh, uh, an AFTA meeting, American Family Therapy Academy, which is an organization for senior family therapy trainers in the U.S. And I had joined it uh, because my mentor told me to, but I never presented for them because it's like presenting for your competition. These were all, you know, senior. But Dick was, you know, spreading the model and he was presenting in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was at that time, maybe 10 miles from where I lived. So I went and it wasn't until he did a demo that I realized that he was into something so far beyond what I was doing or what anybody else I knew was doing that mm -hmm. literally that day I stopped doing what I did and started doing IFS. Wow. And because I have a background in hypnosis, what I found, and when I'm teaching, I found this too, that people who do have a background in hypnosis tend to learn the IFS model more quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. uh, even though Dick, of course, has no interest or background in hypnosis. And uh, so I started doing my version of it and I went out to Michigan to get trained. And I became the only IFS therapist, as far as I know, and I've said this many times and nobody's contradicted me. So I was the only IFS therapist for several years east of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And in 95, in 97, uh, a man named Ralph Cohen, who ran uh, the uh, family therapy, mar marriage counseling family therapy program at University of Central Connecticut, Central Connecticut State University. He uh, read a book called uh, Meta Frameworks, in which IFS was addressed. And he, he has, you know, uh, an eye for promise and talent. And he realized that IFS was a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And he invited Dick to come and teach at University of Central Connecticut. And Dick called me and asked me if I'd help him. So a team got assembled, and that team was Mitchie Rose, a guy named Greg Johansson, Ralph uh, Dick, and myself. And we were the faculty. I was a PA, mm -hmm. and Dick was the teacher. And we did eight trainings at Connecticut 
very, uh, and uh, one of the people who took that training was a psychologist named Mona Barbera, who was the program chairman at a, <laughs> an organization called the New England Society for the Treatment of Trauma and Dissociation, N-E-S-T-T-D, strips right off the tongue. And mm -hmm. uh, she asked Dick to come and introduce IFS to them but they didn't have any money to pay him and he had to come from Chicago. So he refused. So Mona asked me if I would present a high test of them. Mm -hmm. And so I went to McLean hospital uh, where they met and there were about a hundred or maybe a few more trauma therapists. These were people who special, specialized in treating complex trauma. And when, when I did a demo, you know, you could see the, the, the amount of excitement that got generated in the room, especially when I uh, told them that you can essentially work with trauma without uh, ab reaction, without the person having to re-experience the trauma in real time, which when I was trained in trauma, I was taught was an axiom that, you know, in order to treat particularly sexual trauma, the client had to re-experience that trauma, which made trauma treatment very little fun for both the therapist and the client. Mm -hmm. And Dick discovered that you can ask a part that's carrying memories and feelings from trauma to agree not to overwhelm the client. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it won't. <laughs> and I've never heard of a case when it has. And uh, so they were just blown away by it. And I came in and uh, my answering machine, on the, I gave a, this talk on a Friday and on Monday I came in, my answering machine was absolutely full. Wow. Uh, and I, I kind of, it was something over 60 calls I got with people asking me to treat them or treat their husbands. So it was a big, that was a big favorite uh, or they wanted to refer cases. And so there was enormous interest in Boston, in IFS. And I was sharing an office at that time with a man who was uh, a, a hypnosis teacher whose name I'm blocking at the moment, but it'll come back to me. Mm -hmm. And he organized, he invited Dick to come to Boston and give a presentation. And uh, then we did our first training in Boston in, I think, 99. And I was the co-lead. And I taught with Susan McConnell, who uh, was there to sort of teach me how to teach IFS. Because one of the things I found is that I, when I, you're on the circuit and you're doing weekend workshops, you're essentially doing stand-up. Mm -hmm. And you're an entertainer, but you're not really teaching people how to do things. You're teaching people how you do things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I really had to learn a whole new skill set to teach IFS. Mm -hmm. And uh, Susan McConnell was very helpful in me doing that. And then, uh, and Tony Herbine Blank was the assistant trainer in that training. Mm -hmm. And then Tony and I did three trainings until Tony realized that flying in from Durango mm -hmm. uh, was not working uh, materially for her. And yeah. uh, I work with various co-trainers. Uh, I worked with Chris Mathna, and then I worked with, I uh, did 10 year, 10 trainings with Ann Cinco, who I'm still teaching a level two with. And uh, Rena Dubin was the uh, assistant trainer for us in the last, I think two or three we did. And then she took over as my co I always like to teach a level two with someone else because my style, as people will see if they take this course, is very idiosyncratic and I use a lot of hypnotic te technology. So mm -hmm. I really like level one students to have somebody else to imitate if they have trouble imitating me because that's how you learn mm -hmm. is you imitate the people who know yeah. how to do it until you know how to do it. And yeah. uh, so I've been always teaching uh, level ones with someone else. And currently it's uh, been Rena Dubin, although she's just uh, begun to teach independently too, because 
we need to <laughs> teach a lot of people is a huge waiting list for level one as everyone yeah. I think is aware. Yeah. So I say, that, does that sort of cover that question? That's yes, how... definitely. Yes, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's really great to hear about this. You know, early days of IFS and. Um, um sometimes i get this different pieces from different uh, people and um so it's really interesting thank you for sharing all of that uh, i also think that ifs still sparks that curiosity as in early days um you mentioned so many phone calls and um i usually hear the stories about ifs that people say that they immediately you know started to be interested in it so um it's something that it's really special about this model and um, yeah I think that IFS community was very lucky to have you in this early days um, it's, it sounds like you um, brought a lot into the uh, model as well mm. so, so great. well I you know I, I the, the kind of reaction I had to it which was this is the way to work pretty much any sophisticated therapist who sees this demonstrated will have the same reaction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've become the kind of fanatic that stops strangers on the street to give them the good news. I mean, mm -hmm. I, uh, I really, you know, believe that the most important thing in my professional life now is spreading this model to as many people as I can. Yeah. And, you know, recently, because I'm an old guy, I mean, I'm going to be 80 next summer. Uh, I'm, uh, I've decided that the best use of my whatever time I have left is to teach therapists. So I've stopped taking therapy clients. And what I've been doing is as my time opens up, I've been starting more and more consultation groups, for therapists. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, uh, and I'm planning to uh, you know, expand that to the extent that I can manage. Yeah. And so interestingly, uh, I'm busier now at this stage of my career than I was, I've been at any time for the last 25 years. Wonderful. Um, Mike, so, um, we, you know, I, I can see that you, that the one area we are very interested in is difficult protectors. And this is something I would like to talk to you about today. And I would like to start with a question, you know, how, what, what do you mean by a difficult protector? How do you understand this word, you know, this, this um, connection, difficult and well, protector? Yeah, well, uh, you know, IFS is a very simple model. Uh, and there's a real distinction, of course, between simple and easy. Like basketball is a simple game. You throw the ball in the ring. You try to stop the other guy from throwing the ball in the ring. The devil is in the details. And... Uh, so when you begin to uh, basically become acqu acquainted with the system, uh, you know, quite naturally, as you go in anywhere where you're a stranger, somebody comes out and says, can I help you? And this is a gatekeeper. And until you've satisfied their concerns, you're not going to get in. Uh, and so how vigilant is this gatekeeper? Well, if you're uh, working with sort of highly motivated, you know, worried well uh, clients, the gatekeeper is often, you know, pretty uh, cooperative and lax and is happy to uh, be curious and see what you've got to offer. If you're talking to a system that has experienced significant trauma and has uh, never experienced uh, someone with power and authority uh, that's been safe, mm -hmm. then the, uh, the people who are questioning you and managing the boundary are very suspicious, reactive, and hypervigilant. And, uh, and also have possibly adapted certain strategies to keep themselves feeling safe and comfortable that are extreme and off-putting to other people. Uh, and what, uh, and IFS has uh, a very different approach to dealing with these uh, parts than 
uh, the therapies we were mostly all taught in uh, graduate school, which is to, uh, we've been taught to try to find some way of disabling and neutralizing mm -hmm. these uh, parts. And these parts are called resistant and seen as essentially malicious and standing uh, in the way of healing. And IFS sees these beings as potential allies in a project of healing. And so what we do, uh, as my son uh, <laughs> reminded me, we were talking and, and uh, as you know, the US has uh, had some real difficulties with leadership in the last few years. And uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, people who, from our point of view, my son and I, uh, had very extreme views and seemed to have a very destructive understanding of, you know, basically the uh, way our country should go. And my son said, you, you need to remember, Dad, that what we do with parts that have been forced into extreme roles is we extend compassion to them and befriend them. And that's in fact what we do. And of course, our instinct is to do the opposite. Our instinct is to try to neutralize them and until we can find a way to destroy them. <laughs> and yes. uh, the problem with that solution is it's never been successful in the entire history of our species. So, uh, you know, IFS asks us uh, to be counterintuitive and to when a part extends uh, hostile or uh, marital energy, martial energy, not marital, martial energy toward us, uh, we want to find, you know, find a way to befriend that part and discover what its concerns are and address its concerns so that it begins to experience us as a resource rather than a threat. And uh, the, the more a part is beginning, begins with us seeing as it's our threat, they're gonna be a difficult protector. And we understand that these difficult protectors are doing their best to protect and benefit our client, even though uh, our experience and the experience of many of our clients' parts are, they're causing a lot of trouble. You know, they're drinking too much, they're getting into fights, they're uh, ruining their relationships with important people, they're doing, you know, many things that seem to be malignant and destructive. But we go in, or I go in, and IFS therapists go in with the assumption that these are parts that are doing their best to help. And because they've had extreme experiences, uh, their idea of what helps is also extreme. And, uh, and also because these parts uh, are focused on our vulnerable parts. They're not looking out at the world. In other words, my protectors aren't looking at you, Michael, and, and figuring out what, how to deal with you. They're looking at my vulnerable parts and trying to protect them from you. Yeah. And so Therefore, the way they interact with you may in fact be very inconsistent with my best interest. Mm -hmm. Because if anything you do is upsetting my tender parts, they're gonna see you as something to be neutralized and you might think, why is this guy so hostile? What did I do? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the, the reason for that is uh, they're, they're not looking at you at all. They're looking at my tender parts and they're reacting to my tender parts. And so, uh, you know, my, my, therefore the way they get me to behave with you is very likely to influence you in a way, to behave in a way that frightens my protectors and makes them therefore escalate and get you into a polarized relationship with me. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, a lot. Yeah, so of that's, yeah. yeah, so that's what we're sort of up against when we're working with parts that have been forced into an extreme role. And, and when these parts hit our tender parts, 
You know, like if I say to you, you're not interested in helping me. You're just interested in getting money from me. And you're trying to string, you know, and my guess is that might hit a tender part of you. Mm -hmm. And if it does, I may get from you a protective response or a defensive response. And that defensive response will be read by my parts as an attack. And then I'll escalate, inviting you to escalate. And off we are to a bad sequence. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's only a small spark at the beginning, right? And then it grows. Right. But yeah, but, but there's a lot of dry tinder around in almost all of our systems. And it's mm -hmm. very easy for that to get going. And then we get into a very sort of negative exchange and we experience each other as threats. And so what we need to do as we develop skills in IFS is just notice the parts of us that are reacting to protectors and let them know that we'll take care of this and see if mm -hmm. they will give us some space so we're not experiencing their thoughts and th you know and their feelings there so i may have parts that are that want to kill you yeah. but my job is to ask those parts if they'll give me some space so that i can respond to you with curiosity mm -hmm. and i can just be interested in why you seem to be behaving in a way that seems inconsistent with our best interests as a pair. And the more I can do that, the more likely it is I'll be, be able to behave in a way that helps your protectors feel safer and less active. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the problem with protective parts is they never protect. Mm. Uh, what they do invariably is they energize and attract that which they're trying to protect against. That's okay. what they do. Uh, you know, just in case, you know, a, some, a friend of mine once said something, and the minute he said it, I said, oh, my God, I wish I had thought of that first. But I did. Mm -hmm. So my friend's name is Frank Sibley Wright, and I always give him credit for this because I didn't think of it. But what he said was, irony is the driving force of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why, uh, you know, the... the uh, basically, uh, that the counterintuitive tends to work and the intuitive tends not to, and why uh, protective parts uh, invariably put the fire out with gasoline. Mm. Interesting. And but so uh, what we try to do with IFS is to basically not educate the protective parts that they're wrong and they should be doing something else because that has been proved to be a waste of the time. They, they won't and can't do that. Uh, what we try to do is help them understand we are not a threat and, and radiate enough self-energy so that these protectors see us as a resource and will give us access to the parts they're either trying to protect or the parts they're reacting to. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. And, and, and the reason they'll do that is we can solve their problem, which is firefighters are basically uh, constantly in danger of experiencing enormous shame because parts that they think are bad and mean that they're bad become, uh, in, you know, they, they begin to perceive these parts because these parts get active and they need some relief from that shame and they do something that generates trouble or our managers are desperately trying to keep these parts uh, suppressed and, uh, and they can't. <laughs> if they could, we'd all be doing something else. But mm -hmm. happily, there is no danger of this. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we, you know, once they begin to see us as somebody who can help them feel better, <laughs> then we have a very different relationship. And they are no longer difficult 
protectors. And uh, if we can, and we can, unburden the parts they're responding to, then they're able to get out of their extreme position and they stop being a problem uh, for our clients and uh, us, and they can become resources for our clients. How long does it take, Mike, in your experience? Of course, there are different levels uh, to the difficult protectors, right? They're more difficult and less difficult, and probably it varies a lot. But um, is it that sometimes with extreme protectors, you can work for months or even years before they unblend? That's absolutely true. And as a matter of fact, one thing you know that trauma therapists have noticed is that People who have a, a background of what we call complex trauma, and my definition of complex trauma is basically someone who grows up without uh, a safe adult in their life. And uh, so uh, people who have had that background often develop a part that actively resists self-manifesting. They see self manifesting as a threat and they actively resist that. And obviously befriending and uh, getting the cooperation of that part is absolutely essential to being helpful. And it can take years. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't often take years. And of course, the more experience and skill you develop, the the more efficiently you're likely to be able to do that. But I, you know, I've been doing this a while and still uh, I am working with people who uh, took many, many years before they could get any kind of self energy uh, available to their system. And, uh, and I'll be working with these people until one of us dies because I'm still the only real significant relationship they have, and they still have parts that have a yeah. really difficult time feeling emotionally dependent on anybody because of the experiences they had had being emotionally dependent as children. Yeah, yeah. One of them is a person who was sexually abused from the time she was a toddler. And uh, they... It's really hard for her to shake <laughs> that mistrust. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still have many crises between us where I say something that hits a tender part and it will take us weeks to get that repaired. Do you have any, you know, protectors in, in, in such a case um, as a therapist? Well, you see, my, uh, one thing that I say to every group I teach is something that a teacher of mine said to me, and it just rang true, which is therapists are people who need 30 hours of therapy a week, and that's why we do this. And if we need an hour a week, we buy an hour a week. And if we need two hours a week, we can probably work that out. But if you need 30 hours a week, the only way you can get that is to be a therapist. Mm -hmm. Because... Most of the people listening to this have probably been doing this long enough to realize, you know, when I say that to an audience, I get a laugh, but it's a very uncomfortable laugh because it's sort of funny, but everybody knows it's true. That therapy is an exchange. Healing is an exchange. And what I give my clients, I get. And if I didn't need so much, I would be doing something easier and more lucrative perhaps than doing psychotherapy but i i have to do therapy because i need it and as a matter of fact uh just before i ran into the model i had actually decided to stop being a therapist and i started doing organizational consulting which is easier and pays better and the problem was i didn't like it you know it just didn't ring my bell and largely because some part of me was saying, you can't do this, you need therapy. And then I ran into the model and I basically played out the contracts I had as an organizational therapist and mm -hmm. began to uh, take clients again and, 
God sucked back into the fields that we are all so fond of. Interesting, interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Mike, there's a question I, I um, I'm very interested in. It's something that I asked um, Paul Neustadt in, in back in December, uh, also on a, on a meeting like that. And um, I can see that there's a kind of a polarization, I would say, between some IFS therapists around the pace of the therapy. Uh, this is something I um, I can see that Dick, Dick usually just asks the protectors to step aside and, you know, he doesn't take a lot of time to hear them out. If they agree to give space, he just goes straight to the exiles to do the healing. And from some other IFS trainers, I heard that they don't uh, actually agree with, with that and they do it uh, way slower, taking more time to get to know these protectors. Um, and there are, I heard that there's discussions between Dick and trainers and, and there's still like no agreement. And um, I'm very curious, what is your take on that, on the pace of the therapy? Well, uh, you know, Dick actually sat in on a level one I was doing many years mm -hmm. ago, just for a day. And he was talking about this concern he had that he thought some trainers were encouraging people to spend a lot of time with protectors and get really get to know. And I said to Dick, Dick, I'm more on your side than you are. Mm -hmm. And if anything, uh, you know, I basically will spend as little time with protectors as I can mm -hmm. uh, to get access to the parts they're responding to or protecting. And uh, that sometimes uh, I have to spend a lot of time with them because they insist. Yeah. And if, uh, they insist and I will do my best to address whatever concerns they have so that they will introduce me to the parts that uh, need self-energy to heal. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they'll let me do it right away, then I'll do it right away because their benefit is not getting to know me and my charm. Their benefit is getting healed and the way they're going to get healed and being allowed to get out of their extreme role is by having the parts they're responding to heal. Mm -hmm. So it's in their interest to give me access and give my client access as quickly as possible to these. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very uh, allied with Dick on that. I think yeah. that, the, that spending time with protectors early on uh, can be destructive and isn't going to be uh, isn't going to be helpful. That's my opinion. Yeah, that's great to hear because um, lately I was hearing more that other side of this um, conversation. So it's great to hear um, your way of speaking about that. Yeah, um, Mike, we have many questions from uh, our um, attendees today. So um, before we go to Q&A, I would just like to say to everyone that um, this, uh, before we um, uh, look at the questions, but that we are, we have been organizing a workshop, a series of workshops about working with difficult protectors. And um, in just two weeks, we will be kicking off a, a series of four live online workshops called to befriending difficult protectors. And the first one is on the 12th of um, February, then 19th, 26th, and 5th of March. So four meetings, three hours each. Um, I will just briefly show you here. This is our website. Uh, the link will be on the chat. Just in a minute, Philip will share it. Um, so, fellow. Sorry? No, I was just noticing how handsome a fellow this is. Yeah, guy. yeah, he's so handsome, right? Yeah. yeah, so Mike, can you can you say a few words about um, this series, maybe about the contents, about what you are planning to say? And well, uh, as I said before, uh, what I'm trying to do with my time is pass on uh, to as many therapists as possible the uh, things I've learned in the 50 years or so I've been doing therapy. And my background uh, is 
uh, working with, you know, people with very uh, active uh, protectors. And so I developed a skill set uh, when I was a strategic therapist. And strategic therapists basically uh, hold themselves responsible for the response they get from their clients and therefore are uh, working to get a very specific response. And you might call, therefore, that process manipulative. You're trying to get somebody to do something without telling them, look, this is what I'm trying to do. Uh, that skill set uh, and the, the thinking, actually, the skill set is useful. The thinking behind it is not so much. So what I've done is found ways of utilizing that technology without uh, without feeling in a competitive or adversarial relationship with my clients' parts. And I have found those, the, the techniques, therefore, are useful to a lot of my uh, students. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, uh, the background I have in hypnosis, which is basically a, a technology for communicating with parts that are not usually don't have access to our awareness, but are parts that have enormous influence on how we behave and how we respond and how we uh, generate meaning. And uh, so what I, what I want to do is basically communicate to as many therapists as I can what I've learned. And the way I like to do that is, uh, is show them how I do, do what I do. In other words, they will present a difficult, you know, a, a difficult present, uh, protector to me. And I will show them how I would interact with that protector and then get their feedback on how that felt to them and their parts. And, you know, work to help them incorporate that understanding and way of working in, a, in their system in a way that feels congruent to them. Because what I, you know, I recognize that I have a particular instrument that I'm working with. And my instrument is a tall, male, privileged, edu you know, uh, part. And therefore, stylistically, I do things that would feel very uncomfortable to people of a very different instrument. And so I also take some responsibility to help people translate, you know, what I do into a form that is more uh, practical and accessible to them. And uh, so that's what I want to teach and, and, and is IFS is simple. We befriend the protective system and get its cooperation to get access to the parts that are carrying trauma and pain and shame. Because shame is what generates all the stuff that we're working with. And so IFS is a system for essentially draining shame and fear and pain out of a system. And therefore, uh, allowing parts that have been forced into extreme roles to have many more options and, uh, and create more freedom. And so that's what I'm hoping to teach people. And I've had particularly a lot of experience working with parts that have addictive relationships to something. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, addictive relationships, you know, pretty, you know, there, I'm not sure I'll ever meet somebody who doesn't have an addictive relationship in their system. And it, it may be incredibly inobtrusive, but, uh, any relationship that involves shame and deceit, uh, that cannot, that, you uh, you, you, your, the parts you identify with can enforce decisions they make about that relationship and which undermines 
actively undermines your other relationships is an addictive relationship. And sometimes it may be a mild preference for going, you know, it might be that you have to go on a run every day. But uh, if somebody asks you about that, you find yourself feeling defensive and, uh, and saying, well, I don't need to do it every day. I'm not a slave to it. When in fact, you're not sure that's true. And that, in fact, you know, what I found is I had an addictive relationship to running and I developed a stress factor in my foot and I kept running in spite of the fact that it was incredibly painful. That's an addictive relationship. Yeah. And uh, under my, so I've, uh, you know, I have particular uh, interest in helping people uh, make friends with parts that have addictive relationships and are there for full of shame and defensiveness and uh, forming an alliance with them so that they don't uh, distort the client's life to the extent they do. Mm -hmm. I've also developed a lot of techniques because there was a time in my life where I thought if I got technically skilled enough, I would be, I'd feel competent and qualified as a therapist because I don't know about you, but it's not hard for me to find parts that still feel like an imposter and that, you know, any minute they're going to catch wise and expose me for the fraud that I am. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the way I dealt with that fear was to learn more and more technique. And what you realize is that technique doesn't make you a good therapist, but it can help a good therapist be more efficient. Mm -hmm. And so I've developed a bunch of techniques, which I also will share with people. And some of them right. people will find useful and some of them mm -hmm. won't. There's a technique that I derive from hypnosis that cures phobias in one session. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not IFS in that it's much more directive and much less, uh, curious you know i know what i'm trying to do and i go in and do it and i understand that ifs has one answer to every question and that answer is curiosity mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh it's not really ifs but i i do teach that technique and people will use it mm -hmm. as they wish it also by the way cures uh anxiety attacks and uh this is just a little uh, I guess, sales pitch that I will, in fact, teach people how to do that. And it does work. Yeah, that's my sparks, one today. That's, <laughs> that sparks a lot of curiosity. Um, thank you, Mike, for sharing that. Um, I would just say that um, this series will be recorded and the recordings will be shared without time limits for everyone. And this is 12 hours in total with a, certifi with a certificate of completion. Um, so the link to this series will be shared in the email and also Philip will once again put it on the chat. And um, yeah, so we are inviting you all uh, very much and looking forward to seeing you there. Um, and Mike, we have a lot of questions. So, okay, well, I'll deal with the ones we have time for as best I can. These are very interesting questions. So, I, I would like to just to invite you to uh, keep the answers uh, concise so we can. I'll do answer. my best. Concise, answer. as you noticed, is not my strong suit, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Yeah, it has uh, it has its advantages. Um, yes, so, I can I understand agree. that. Yeah, so um, the first question is from Mirabella. Um, she asks, how do you address protectors that just don't let the client go into parts mode? Just keep distracting them and just keep talking about a million other things instead. They just don't let the client go inside and the client avoids the concept of parts altogether. Sure. Well, uh, well uh, why do they do that? They do that because they're afraid that if they don't do that, something that they don't want to have happen will happen. That's why, and, and they see uh, going inside as being dangerous because uh, they fear 
that if they go inside, they will discover something ugly and bad and horrible, and that is intolerable. And so uh, they do their best to try to keep the client safe uh, by doing that. So uh, what I help them, what I do is I address that concern, and I understand that that's a valid concern, and that uh, they haven't had much luck going inside before because they have, in fact, found parts that think they're bad. But happily, these parts are mistaken. And what's more, self-energy can prove to them they're mistaken. And so once uh, these parts understand that I take their concerns seriously and I understand, then we work out we negotiate a way of proceeding, which will require an acceptable risk on the part of the protector. And it will be an acceptable delay for my parts. Because uh, basically one of the things I say is, you know, I wake up in the morning, I go to work, I negotiate with parts to unblend and I go home at night. That's what I do. That's what IFS therapists do as they negotiate with parts to unblend. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's funny. So, so you you probably use direct access um, in such cases. Well, I do, and I also do uh, pseudo insight, which is mm -hmm. I'll say so. See what this part thinks about this idea, and I say this idea. Now I know I'm talking to the part. Yeah. But I'm acting as if there's separation because what I found is if I do that a little while, there will be. Mm -hmm. And then there will, the client will begin to experience that there's this part and they're relating to the part rather than they are the part. And so I use direct access and I also use a form of direct access that I call pseudo insight, which is I'm pretending that there's a uh, separation, even though I strongly suspect there isn't. Interesting. Okay. So the next question is from Tanya. Um, uh, where, where suicide risk and self-harm are constant and extremely severe and protectors won't or can't allow access to exiles, how does one prove to protectors or give them hope that healing can happen? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, when you discover the possibility that there is a part that's dangerous to our client, existentially dangerous to our client, uh, or even just dangerous, uh, dangerous parts are the parts you need to make friends with first. Uh, so if I become aware of a suicidal part, my job, as I understand it, is to befriend that suicidal part and to uh, essentially negotiate with that suicidal part a different plan because there are two kinds of suicidal parts. There are uh, savior suicidal parts that wanna just be a resource to get out of unbearable pain if there's nothing else to be done. And there are punisher suicidal parts that think that my client is a despicable evil mess and needs to be wiped off the earth. And there are basically, obviously these two types of suicidal parts need to be spoken to differently, just like managers and firefighters need to be spoken to differently. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've had a lot of luck uh, being able to befriend these parts and get them to essentially become uh, allies and resources in our project of healing. Mm -hmm. And that's what has to happen because uh, they're both trying to solve a problem in one case, the problem is the pain is unbearable. And what I help them understand is that this pain can be healed without the client's body having to die. Mm -hmm. uh, or their problem is that they are part of a despicable uh, evil system. And what I help them understand is uh, that, in fact, uh, that's a mistake and in fact they are not part of a 